Welcome to our live chat, YouTube Middle Grade. I'm your host, Kim Ventrella, and I'm chatting with Jacqueline Westway, author of the brand new novel, Long Lost. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Jacqueline. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to talk about Long Lost, and we are, of course, taking live viewer questions too. So if we have people out there watching with burning questions for Jacqueline, get those in the chat. Um, but I also have a lot of burning questions about this amazing book, and we can see it right behind you. But first of all, so for people who may not have heard about or may not have gotten their copy yet of Long Lost, can you tell us a little bit about the story? Sure. So uh, Long Lost is about a girl named Fiona who is forced to move to this odd little town in semi-rural Massachusetts um, because of her older sister's figure skating career. They're moving to be closer to her coach. And so she ends up in this tiny, very old, very insular, very eerie town uh, with a really unique library. The library was a private mansion that the heiress who owned it um, left to the town. So it's now the public library. And in that library, Fiona finds a mystery novel that doesn't have an ending. Uh, but as she reads, more and more of the places in the book she realizes match the places in her new town. And eventually she starts to figure out that the book might actually be set in this eerie little town where she now lives. Uh, and that the reason it might have no ending is because no one actually knows what happened. Maybe the story was all true. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a book within a book. It's a ghost story, it's a mystery. It's very much a love letter to libraries. Yeah, yeah that's long lost. <laughs> I mean, and I got a chance to read an early copy of this book, so that was really exciting because as you can hear, it has everything that I would love in a book, right? It has every single thing. And, you know, I worked as a librarian for a lot of years, and I have to say none of the libraries that I worked in were former mansions. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I never found a mysterious book that was unfinished and maybe the pages were like added to as I learned new information that never happened to me. I'm so mad. So unfortunate. So yeah, I mean, I've never, never been in a library that was a private creepy former mansion either, but there is one in Wisconsin and a librarian at an event that I was doing is the one who told me, oh, have you ever been to the old Portage Public Library? It was donated to the town by this forgotten Pulitzer Prize winning authoress who when she died, her grand mansion became the town library. And then in 1995, they realized we need more space. We need like a more traditional <laughs> library. Um, so it's not the public library anymore, but it's still there. And it is just uh -uh. what you can imagine. It's this giant, yeah, mansion full of fireplaces and wood paneling. And yeah, that's part of where the idea came from. <laughs> Yeah, that's so amazing. I love it. And like you said, it really is a love letter to libraries. And so what is, like, were libraries a big part of your inspiration growing up? I can just picture you spending time in some, like, ancient library full of mysteries. <laughs> uh, libraries were definitely huge in my life. I can still picture the, my very first library card with my little typewritten name, you know, glued in the middle. Um, but my, my town's public library was nothing like the one in Long Lost. It was a little crammed single story brick building right next to the police station in our tiny little town. So yeah, there was nothing romantic or grand about it. But to me, like as a tiny child, it seemed gigantic and it had every kind of book that I wanted to read. And I spent a lot of hours literally sitting on the bare carpet, huddling between the aisles, sometimes even copying down my favorite poems in a little notebook or browsing through things that I maybe shouldn't have been reading yet. But yeah, I have all kinds of fond memories of, of libraries and that was my very first one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is so cool. I. I think that's me too. Like it was more like the magic was in the stories. I don't have any like memory of what, of going into like one of these really amazing old libraries. Although I have to say when I moved to New Orleans, because I went to college in New Orleans, they had one of the Carnegie libraries and those are sometimes I think in those old buildings and that was a pretty cool space. But yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that though. I love that you bring in all of these elements that people really adore and have come to expect from you, like the old houses and the magic that's hidden in these ordinary objects like the books. 
and maybe something a little ghostly and mysterious going on. And I also love the parallel that you draw in Long Lost. So you have these two sets of sisters that are separated by more than a hundred years, right, in time, but we start to see all of these parallels between them. So is like the topic of sisterhood, is this important to you personally? Like, do you have a sister or did you just imagine it for? <laughs> Funnily enough, I do not have a sister. <laughs> I have two younger brothers, so I, I am a sister. Um, and I'm the oldest one in the family, so I, I never had the situation that my protagonist has of sort of feeling mm -hmm. forgotten and overlooked and being the younger child. And um, you could talk to my brothers, they probably do. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the just wanting to write about sisters and that bond, that mostly came out of probably out of fiction that I loved, as well as just, you know, like we often get to put ourselves into lives we don't get to have. And certainly uh -huh. I did think, oh, it would be fun to have a sister, maybe even an older sister or a twin sister, you know, as someone who doesn't have a sister thinks. Um, so yeah, getting to, to now play with all of that in fiction is fun, but no, nope, it's not my own life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always fun. I love to play around with stuff like that, too. And so in the story, her sister is a figure skater, and they're always having to do stuff for her competitions. And they've actually moved so she can be closer to the training like rink, right? right. Um, so do you, is, is it just like a fascination with figure skating? And like we get, you know, that world, like we don't necessarily get a glimpse into it. We're more like jealous of the sister that's doing it. But do you have a background in that? Um, I, you know, I, I'm from the Midwest and it's, I, my neighborhood I had a little outdoor open all winter rink. And so I, I skated, but I was never serious about it or good at it. Um, and, but I did grow up in the era where I feel like it was figure skating, the Olympic figure skating was such a big deal. You know, it was the era of like mm -hmm. Yamaguchi and Surya Bonali and Katerina Witt and so on, all these people who were like household names and celebrities. So as a kid, yeah, they seem so glamorous and magical. And I'm sure that my kid mind still puts that into <laughs> stories that are written for young readers. Um, and also it just, in terms of the story, it made sense. That is such a demanding sport for a kid to pursue, mm -hmm. but such an unusual one that any kid who gets serious about it really does have to make those sort of sacrifices. You are either, you know, homeschooled and constantly training and living at the rink, or you are moving and maybe even living with your coach. So yeah, all the research mm -hmm. that I did definitely sort of reinforced, yeah, this is an intense life for a kid who is serious about figure skating. Yeah, absolutely. And being the sister of that person, you can imagine, would be difficult. And she kind of feels left behind until, of course, she discovers kind of her own thing and her own secret that she's able to pursue. And so a lot of the time you have the various sisters that are sneaking out of the house and they're going on these adventures by themselves and getting into dangerous situations. So of course that's really, I mean, I, I want to read about that stuff. And when I was a kid, like, yes, I want to imagine that I am able to do all of these things and I don't have to rely on adults. But were you actually sneaking out of the house at that age or are you just living vicariously like <laughs> through the characters? Uh, I, I never got to sneak out and do anything especially important. <laughs> But I, mm -hmm. I did know how to unlatch and then sneakily push out the store window and the screen in my childhood mm -hmm. bedroom, and climb out and run away across the neighborhood um, at night when I was not supposed to. But, but uh, <laughs> the problem with that was it was impossible to put the screen back in <laughs> from inside my room. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, basically always gave myself away. And I think that's, so that's funny. just another fantasy, uh, uh, the idea of, you know, when you are 11, 12 years old and just starting to get that taste of independence, but still generally not allowed to have it, you know, but uh, but wanting it and, and be old enough now to have ideas and goals of your own. And yet, you know, so little mobility and so little. <laughs> so I think that's something that I often give to my protagonist is, yeah, I'm going to let you have the chance this potentially dangerous, potentially risky thing because you want to. Uh, what would the story be without it? So. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I love, love that aspect of it. Um, and we are taking viewer questions as well. So if anyone has a question that they want to ask 
to Jacqueline. Get that question in. The more burning, the better. <laughs> All questions welcome. Um, so I kind of mentioned that you often have this thing with the old houses, the Victorian type, you know, <laughs> um, architecture and things like this, and the houses that contain secrets that maybe have been hidden for a really long time, and these mysteries from the past that the characters have to discover. Um, I love, I love those, those aspects of your stories. Does that come from the things that you were reading as a kid or what made you fall in love with those kind of like mystery elements? Um, I, I, funnily, a lot of it often starts with setting for me. Mm -hmm. The house that inspired my first series, The Books of Elsewhere, was a real house that I used to pass every day on the way to middle mm -hmm. school. And as a kid, just seeing, like, I lived in this very normal little ranch house, but here's this crumbling Victorian mansion. It just, the kind of place that has to have an interesting past and interesting secrets mm -hmm. hidden inside of it. And so, yeah, just looking at that through the school bus windows and imagining the things that might have happened there, the lives of the people who get to live inside of it. That's where so much of my you know, fiction idea comes from. And it still does today. I'm often inspired by houses, by buildings, especially anything old that looks like it has a past. <laughs> I, I love every house is like this potential treasure box of stories because things have happened there, births and deaths and who knows what else. Um, and of course, in my stories, they're usually creepy things. But uh, <laughs> and I think that was the kind of story I was drawn to as a kid. But um, I, it also just came from my own real life, like my grandparents. Mm -hmm had a house that was very different from our house. It was this rambling old place, mm -hmm. great crumbling stone basement and a creepy attic. And that house is still just implanted in my mind as this giant you know, kingdom where you might find secrets, where there were always things to explore. So yeah, I, I think that's where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. And I think just that, like you said, this idea that old things probably have layers hidden underneath. And so there's so much like you just, you know, that if you dig a little deeper, like if you scratch away that paint, you might find something that nobody else knows about, or a secret that people have forgotten about. And so you mentioned sometimes starting with setting, but Miss Nikki wanted to know, where do you get your story ideas from? Is it always from setting and specifically with long laws? Where did that idea come from? So Long Lost is odd compared to a lot of my books where, where I feel like I'm putting together a giant jigsaw puzzle. I will often have one piece of the story and it waits around in my brain for years and then suddenly it latches mm -hmm. with another piece and you know how it just sort of starts yeah. to construct itself. And sometimes it'll be a character, sometimes a place. With Long Lost, I was um, driving down a rural road in Minnesota and out the passenger side window, I noticed this crooked street sign, you know, just a regular green and white street sign, but something about that sign, like latched on to something else in my head. And I immediately had the idea of a girl in a small town library, reading a book mm -hmm. that she realizes is set in this town. And then that the story within the book is this long buried secret that there is something unsolved, unresolved that she is going to uncover by using the actual current setting. Yeah, so that's <laughs> one of those flash moments. And I don't know why that just that magic street sign did it. <laughs> yeah. What I tell kids on school visits is yeah, ideas can come from anywhere, obviously. I mean, they yeah. often come from things I see out the car window or the school bus window in the case of my first books. They come from things I overhear, places I travel. And so I'm like this magpie, you know, collecting little shiny things, <laughs> puzzle pieces that I will eventually try to fit together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's great. great. And, and like, it's like, it's like, a, like scientist. a scientist, like, scientist. like you, have you have to be, to be prepared. <laughs> um, your mind has to be prepared to have that great idea when the moment strikes. So I love that. I love like that. You're, you're always prepared, prepared for inspiration. <laughs> You try and you need to have pen and paper handy. I have so many times also had to like pull over to the side of the road and write on my hand or on my arm because I have nothing else to write the idea on. But yes, you have to be ready when the inspiration strikes or you'll forget it. <laughs> awesome. Um, 
Do you hear like I'm echoing right now? I think I'm just a ghost who is echoing. <laughs> I hear you pretty normally. So okay, perfect, nice. perfect. <laughs> I was going to talk about how you get your ideas, but how do you start in on the writing process? So once you kind of have that inspiration, where do you begin? Is it with that setting that is so important to you or is it with the characters? Like what is your entry point to a story? I am a very chronological writer and I am a, a longhand writer. So I write all my drafts, pen and paper, uh, and I usually cannot get started until I know what the first line is going to be, or at least where the story itself needs to start. Um, so it's not the most efficient way to work. <laughs> I do not outline. I often don't know what's going to happen at the end of the book. Um, but yeah, that's that's where I begin is at the beginning. To me, that's just the only way that works. And then I have to draft through the whole thing longhand. Often I have to tear out gigantic amounts of it later and realize none of this works. Um, but I have to figure that out by doing it, by getting it down on paper. Um, and so I do realize that many, many of my stories start with a description of setting or with a person in an unfamiliar place where that is often where to me, the most interesting sort of conflict begins, that out of place protagonist, someone discovering all the secrets um, or sensations of a new location. Yeah, that's really often where I start. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that. And Miss Nikki says she does hear me echoing, so I guess I'm just cool today. Um, but you might need to mute yourself, Jacqueline. Like we can alternately mute each other. And then there we go. That hopefully will solve it. Um, but we are still taking questions that people may have out there. But I personally have a lot of questions about this, the whole writing process thing, because I know that Jacqueline is not only a New York Times bestselling author, but someone who's been in the business for a long time. Um, and so I'm interested to know in how your process has evolved over time. Um, so with this book, and tell us like what number is long lost, like in your whole catalog, and like how has your process changed when it has come to this book? So Long Lost is my 11th novel for young readers. Uh, and my process has definitely changed in that when I began, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I had written this book, but didn't know what the journey, especially involving revision, was going to entail. Um, and so I have learned over time, I think, I hope, to be my own editor. I mean, not as well as any of the editors that I work with, and thank God for all of them because they catch me over and over. But but you do do learn eventually, like, what are your weaknesses? What things are you not putting on the page that you think are there because they're in your brain? Um, and so, yeah, with time, I've gotten to the point where I can, can look for that. And I've also gotten far, far more detached. I still when I'm first drafting something and it's in that little baby stage of it's just my own scribbly handwriting on paper and it still feels really fragile and really unformed, yes, then I still have like an emotional connection to it or a protective feeling about it. But once I feel like it's a complete object, like it's, you know, the clock is built and you start the pendulum swinging, then I sort of feel like now it's not, you know, it's not totally mine anymore. I've gotten far more detached and objective. And so then having the input of critique partners, my agent, my editor, all the people who help make the book better uh, throughout that revision process, that's far, far easier to incorporate and to not have that, you know, anguish that like, my first couple of books were just so difficult that way, not just because it felt like here's this thing that I made out of myself and it's not good enough, but also because you don't know how to fix it. You don't know if you can fix it until you've done it a few times and then you realize, oh, I, I can fix it. No matter how bad it seems, I'm gonna figure something out. <laughs> oh yeah, that's so true. It's such a process and it's really good to hear like how far you've come and I, you know, I've been doing this for a short, much shorter time, but still some, some, you know, like four or five years, I guess, if you put it all together. Um, and yeah, I could totally agree with that. Like you get, you're able to 
detach a lot more, which is a really good thing because they are so close to your heart. And once you're able to view the your work a little bit more objectively, it can really um, save you from a lot of heartache. But uh, we did have a question from Mindy. It's a great question. What is your favorite underrated book? I know it's always hard to pick like a favorite book of any kind, but so we'll probably give you the option to do like a couple, but, <laughs> but yes, if you have a favorite underrated book. Now I just, I need to go stare at my bookshelves and like write a giant list. Cause yes, there are so many and I'm terrible at never being able to pick just one that I feel like this is underrated, but people should love it. Um, uh, one that I keep mentioning over and over that I read recently and that I loved so much. And I, I don't think it's underrated. It seems to be getting plenty of attention, but I thought it should get even more. <laughs> um, is The Girl and the Ghost by Hannah Alcalf. That was absolutely beautiful. And to me, like that is, it's just, it proves what good middle grade can do. Um, but one that I also read recently and that I haven't heard other people talking about, and perhaps it's because the author is British, I need to go find the rest of her stuff, um, is The Crowfield Curse. And it's new, and I cannot remember the author's name right now. I think it's Catherine Fisher. Hey, that came up out of like the dregs of my mind. Um, and she is Welsh, and so it's, you know, published here after it's published there. But it was really, it's so spare, it's so clever, it's so classic. It was just great. It was just the kind of like gothic, wintry, creepy, fantastical, you know, creepy manor house setting, everything that I love and done so well. And so I hope that more people in this country uh, find it. I think she's got the recognition over there. But yeah, the Crowfield Curse, it was, I hope it, no, not the Crowfield Curse, the Clockwork Crow. <laughs> I'm mixing it up. There is another book called the Crowfield Curse, which is also good. This is the Clockwork Crow. That is the one I'm talking about, but Catherine. <laughs> You're so like me, like when I'm trying to remember the details of my favorite books of all time, I can never remember like the details. I'm like, but this was my favorite book and I loved it so much. But I think we just read so many books, uh, but that book sounds amazing. So I will definitely be checking that one out for sure. And so like you said, Long Lost is your 11th book. And this is another one for middle grade readers, but you have a number of books out both for middle grade and young adults. So do you have any book in your catalog that you feel like is maybe underrated or that got less attention than some of your other books and that you want to tell people about? Well, thank you because yes. <laughs> um, my, my middle grade, I am really lucky, has found a lot of readers, but my YA, because it's a whole different, you know, ballpark, has not been the same. Um, my favorite thing that I have ever written is my most recent YA novel, which is called Last Things, and I don't have it handy, unfortunately, but it's my modern day Minnesotan metal reimagining of the legend of the musician who might have sold his soul to the devil. Uh, and this came out kind of right before all the, you know, wildness that we're in right now in late 2018. Uh, and now it's out in paperback. And yeah, I'm still, I just, that's a book that I wrote, not under contract, that I wrote just for me. It was the kind of story I wanted to write. I had all these ideas that wouldn't leave me alone. And then it just poured out and I had so much fun constructing it. And yeah, it's the thing that if, if people haven't read um, of mine, I hope you'll give it a try, adults or young adults, uh, because yeah, it's still, it's, it's my favorite weird, dark little book that I've written. So. <laughs> Yes, last things. And I, you just described every book I like. We are dark little books that, <laughs> you know, that maybe have gone undiscovered, but those are generally like my favorite books of all time. Um, and so Mindy had another great question because you have had so many books. So do you still celebrate after you finish a book? And if so, how do you celebrate? I guess like when you finish a book, but also when it releases, has it changed over the years, like the way that you celebrate? I wish I could say that I do celebrate. I should, like I would tell any other author, oh my gosh, celebrate every good little thing that happens because most of your life, you're going to be looking at what isn't working well enough or what you wish you had and you don't. Um, 
but I'm not, I'm not good about that, honestly. And I think part of the problem for me with celebrating when you finish a book is that it never feels finished, you know, just because I've finished a draft. Uh uh, now my agent's going to tell me, and then my editor's going to tell me over and over and over again, and then the copy editor is going to tell me, and then I'm going to realize why I do final pass pages that are still things that I want to fix. It never feels done, you know, even when you realize, okay, this is as good as I can get it for now without completely losing my mind. It doesn't necessarily feel like, okay, now it's finished. There might always be something else that comes back, something else that, you know, you'll have to resolve. So I think that's part of why. And because my focus, honestly, whenever I am wrapping up one book and I'm getting to that phase, copy edits and, you know, polishing up, I'm so deep in my next thing, usually by then, that half my brain is now in another little world, a place where I'm having fun building things and getting started all over again. That's really my favorite part. So I guess I'm not good enough about celebrating, <laughs> but usually what I do when a book comes out, and it's not that way this time around, but usually there's, you know, a, there are school visits, there are bookstore events, there's cake, there's, you know, celebrating with family and friends, and that's all lovely. This year is very different, but it's actually, it, it's kind of nice to have a very quiet release in a way, and just to hope that, that readers are still finding and reading the book, because that's what matters. It's not you know, yeah, me actually being there with the cake in the bookstore. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. I totally agree that it never feels finished, like you said, so you don't quite know when to celebrate. And even as you, as it's gone through those final passes, and now it's probably, you know, sometimes like even before you do the final pass, the arcs, are out and people are reading it. And so there could be a certain amount of anxiety that's building up, up now because you know the first reviews are gonna start coming in. So you mentioned that you kind of, over time, you've become more detached and like able to take that criticism during the editorial process. So is that the same when it comes to the book being out in the world and like the reviews starting to come in? Do you feel that you're able to handle it differently and like be more resilient than you were in the beginning maybe? Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, with, yeah, with my first book, it all felt so raw because writing a book is so personal. It's so much work that's just you alone in your head. Um, so when, it, when you are you know, offering that to the world, and if anyone rejects it or criticizes it, it feels like they are rejecting you. If they don't like that book, they don't like you because that book is you. Um, and yeah, I've kind of finally gotten past that fallacy. <laughs> it took several books. Um, with my first book, you know, my first book got this lovely push from my publisher and all kinds of amazing stuff happened for it. It made a bunch of awards lists and it was, you know, New York Times bestseller and Indie Next top 10 and blah, blah, blah. A bunch of lovely, lovely, like, Halley's Comet type stuff where all these wonderful things came together. And it got some great reviews and some stars. It also got the cruelest review I've still ever gotten in my career. And it was the first review of all because it was Kirkus, who enjoys <laughs> being the one mean one. Um, so yeah, my very first professional trade review was from Kirkus and it was just brutal. It was so, <laughs> I want to say vicious. I mean, it was professional, but uh, it was so rough that I can still remember parts of it. Um, and I still remember coming downstairs that morning and my husband saying, wow, I just, uh, I saw Kirkus's review. You're about to go through one of those things that authors go through. And I'm really glad it happened that way. That actually taught me something valuable is have a human firewall. If you have like a family member or a friend or a writing partner, who's the one who's willing to get the Google alerts for your name, it's really smart because then they can pass along the things that matter and you don't have to be obsessing over, you know, every little thing. And then you've got someone there with you when the really bad stuff does come. <laughs> so yes, at first it was, it was very emotional. It was very tough, um, but I do, I've detached more and more and places like Goodreads, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that they exist but they're not for us, you know, they're not for authors. They are for passionate readers and wonderful. I'm so glad there are passionate readers, but I avoid that site like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I, 
I don't need or want to know, you know, what every single reader thinks about everything that I write. That is totally their prerogative to hate and say awful things. And that's just fine. That's great. I just don't need to know. <laughs> um, and yeah, accepting that not everyone is going to love what you write, that some people hopefully will, some people won't. Yeah, that, that comes with time and with enough experience. So I've definitely gotten a tougher skin over time. Oh yeah, that's great. And I, I do think it's amazing that it happened in that order because what a blow, but then to have that, the wild success come right after that, like I can just imagine how that must have felt like as all of that news rolled in, you're like, wow. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it is still hard. I mean, I know I was so scared of licking that I would never lick myself up. I mean, I definitely wouldn't do a Google alert for myself, but I would never go to my Amazon page because I didn't want to see like the stars or whatever. And I finally had to go in just like recently and like update stuff. And I, at first I was like physically shaking. Like I did not anticipate that. I was like, wow. But then once I got over it, it was kind of nice. It was like ripping off a bandaid. And I was like, okay, I could do this. This wasn't, you know, <laughs> I had, it was more than I had built it up to be. But yeah, it's, it definitely takes time to get over that. There's probably some level to which you don't necessarily get over it. You just learn how to, like you said, like certain things are not geared toward authors. And so you just steer clear of those. And that's really helpful <laughs> for me. Um, so we did have, well, <laughs> proud to be the firewall <laughs> slash question. So this is your human firewall, I take it. Um, can there be a last thing sequel asking for a friend? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I feel like that story is told and I'm very happy with how it concluded. So I don't think so. Although like, I would love to go back to that world and write some more just for the chance to get to live inside of it again. That's such a pleasure of writing a book that you are really enjoying writing. Um, so yeah, I want to go back and hang out at the crow's nest and write my imaginary metal music. But no, I think that story is done. Sorry. <laughs> oh boy. Well, I guess you never know. And so your first book though was part of this big series, The Books of Elsewhere. And like since then you have some things that are maybe shorter series or standalones like Long Lost, I'm assuming is meant to be a standalone. Um, so what was that shift for you? Like was that strange to shift from something that was this very long series to things that are more standalone? Yes, definitely strange, but in most ways, really comfortable. Um, <clears throat> I spent 13 years working on the books of Elsewhere, you know, because that, your debut book, you work on it for ages, and then there's the whole seeking representation and publication process. So that was eight years with that first book, and then five more years completing this five book series. And to have like your career begin with this gigantic five book series, a book a year, plus all the promotion that goes with it, if that hadn't been my very first project, I don't think I would have had the hubris to be like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I'll just jump in. Um, I, I'm very proud and happy of the way it all turned out. And I still hear from readers all the time who are still finding the books. And that makes me feel so, so lucky. And I loved the the time that I got to spend in that world. That's another one where if I, if I wanted to, you know, I could open the door and step back into Olive's house and know exactly what all the cats would do and say, and it would be fun to, you know, play with all of them again. But, but I feel like that's concluded. And after having spent so much time in this one imaginary world, I really wanted to make some different imaginary friends. <laughs> I really wanted the chance to start something from scratch and do something that was a different scale. Um, because for me, it felt like with each subsequent book in that series, like I was building this really elaborate little block building and then you're building it taller and taller and each book is constructed on top of the one that came before. And so it feels more and more gigantic and more and more fragile. I was so afraid of, you know, crushing something or removing a piece somewhere and now the foundation is ruined. Um, so yeah, the, the construction of a series is, it's a tricky thing. And getting to do a standalone instead, now for me, just a regular length novel feels much easier because of what I've been through, which is kind of lovely. So um, yeah, getting to write a standalone feels refreshing and fun. It, it feels like ah, this is something so much more manageable. Um, and yeah, my collectors is just a duology. It's uh, the collectors and then a storm of wishes. And yes, Long Lost is a standalone. 
And I don't know what's going to be next, but I get the feeling it will not be another series, at least not for a while. I'm enjoying this scale. <laughs> Yeah, that is a really interesting way to start with something so huge. And I agree. Wow, it would be a big undertaking to keep it all together. Um, did you have like a story Bible or something like that for the series to make sure that you never, you know, like they do a TV shows, they have these huge story Bibles, so they never like miss something. Did you have to do something like that for the books of Elsewhere? Uh, I should have, but no. <laughs> it's another thing that, like, if I were doing it now, I would probably have figured it out. But no, I was flying by the seat of my pants for so much of that. The reason I think it, it worked is because I was writing them in such quick succession. I was writing just one after another. One is releasing and I'm halfway through or most of the way through the next one. That it really did feel like one cohesive thing. So I don't think I was forgetting major elements of the, you know, the first one by the time I got to book five. But... I also had a brilliant copy editor and oh my God, like thank every, yeah, every God in the pantheon for her because she would find things like in the second book, I had Olive, my main character, trying to open a trap door in the basement by, you know, wedging her fingernails under it. And she wrote, why is she doing that? You described that there's a hook in the trap door in book one. Like she would remember every little deep things that, yeah, I just, <laughs> and that is one of the brilliant gifts of copy editors. They do notice and remember all those details and they catch you when you're about to do something embarrassing. Um, so yeah, no, no story Bible. I should have had one, <laughs> but I'm grateful for the team I had helping to save me from stuff like that. Oh yeah, the copy edits are very cool. The last one I had, they came up with this, and maybe they do this every time, this is the first time I had seen it, this elaborate chart of like everything. And it like listed out like every, I don't know, just like settings, like everything that was mentioned. It was like, this was mentioned on these pages and like, here's where you can find that. I was like, wow, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> I've never seen it done that format before. And that was for a standalone novel. So I can just imagine what how elaborate it would be for like a huge series like that. Um, but yes, reminder, if people are just tuning in, we are taking questions. And I know we had, this is a question that I get every time I do an interview from Miss Nikki. This is kind of her farewell question. So it must be time for Miss Nikki to head out. But we're going to take a little detour to our classic question from Miss Nikki, which is, what is your favorite TV reality show? <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Well, I believe I have revealed this before, and so I'm sorry if I'm boring you, but I'm a gigantic fan of RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, yeah, I have seen every episode multiple times, and in season 11, a good friend of mine was a competitor who made it very close to the end. Oh, wait, who's your friend? Jessica Kane is my college buddy. Oh, wow. Together. And he never got to sing in his season. I was, like, waiting for the musical challenge so you could all hear him. He's wonderful. Uh, so, yeah. But I had loved that show long before he got to be on, and then it was just like, oh, I'm so proud. Um, so yeah, that's probably my favorite reality TV show. <laughs> yes, awesome. I too, although I'm behind on a couple seasons because I'm broke, but you know, <laughs> it is a really fun show. Um, so we have to thank Miss Nikki for that question. Now we know the favorite reality show of like every author who has ever been interviewed by me on any platform so we love it <laughs> uh, so yes let's get into kind of some more questions so i know also miss nikki is an educator and i know an aspiring middle grade author as well and so we've established that you've been in this business for a while so i'm wondering like on the business side of things like the business of writing have you learned things just about you know, like the industry or like how you would approach writing as a business that you want to pass on to people who are just starting out. Because I know a lot of times when people are just starting out, they don't really think of it. Like I know for me, I was like, oh, I'm a tortured artist. I'm not a small business. Well, <laughs> so have you learned things that you would tell to someone who had been starting out like me? Uh, yeah, keep your receipts um, for tax purposes all the stuff that you need as a writer, which includes stuff that you love, like books and coffee, you can expense that stuff. <laughs> there are a lot of things that are, that are deductible that you should really be deducting. Um, and also my advice, just 
if you are not a math person and I am not a math person, is get an accountant who you trust because being a writer, it's a it's an unusual way to make a living and trying to figure out just like the self-employed aspects of this and what you can deduct and what you can't and et cetera. It's good to have somebody who knows what they're doing to help you out. Um, beyond that though, uh, and something I, I always say to aspiring writers, and I, I actually, I was a teacher myself when I got my book contract. If I hadn't signed a contract for a five book series, you know, if I hadn't known I'm going to be releasing a book a year at this certain amount of payment, where I felt like I could rely on that for at least the next five years. I don't think that I would have made the jump into writing full time. Also, I have a spouse who has what I call the grown up job because he gets benefits, you know, like, and writers don't. There's so much that, especially when you're young and starting out, you don't, you don't feel like is as much of a, a vital thing. But then you realize more and more with time, yeah, I want health insurance, I want dental insurance, and that stuff is very hard to manage on just an author's salary, even if you are incredibly lucky with your publishing rate or your advances. Um, writing is just so unpredictable. It's really, really tough to know from year to year. So I'll have an amazing year, and then I'll have a really quiet year because there's just not a book that year. And then the next year might have two or three. I had four books come out in one year um, a little while ago, but most years are not like that. So you have to kind of prepare yourself for really erratic uh, financial times. And if you are lucky and have someone who can share benefits with you, great. I mean, maybe we need to go back to like that wealthy patron system so we can be tortured artists and still have someone like get our teeth fixed if that's necessary. Because otherwise, yeah, the world and the way that, that this country is structured is very tough on anyone who's a freelancer or who is an artist for a living. It's just, it's tough. Yes, I can definitely echo that as someone who does not unfortunately have a patron to <laughs> although I do have my dog. Um, although I'm gonna say she ends up costing more money than she earns these days, so she needs to work on that. But um, so we had another question um from Miss Nikki. So yeah, she loves hearing about the logistics and wants to know do you use Scrivener? How do you map things out, etc.? So all great questions, and I will pass those to you. I want to hear your answer on this too, Kim, after I talk. I, I don't use Scrivener. Some of the um, writers in my critique group do, and so I know like they are zealots for it. Um, I haven't learned it. I know it's complicated to learn, and I am, like you probably know or can guess from my drafting habits, I am a very sort of Luddite <laughs> when it comes to uh, involving certain kinds of technology with the writing process. Anything that to me feels interruptive of just getting stuff out on paper at first, I can't handle. Um, so no, my process is, yes, ink on paper, then I revise, I just use Microsoft Word. And, um, and I actually like to print out and have things in giant binders, which I have behind me, so that I can do all my revising by hand once again. That is my system. Um, sometimes they're full of little post-it notes and, you know, like there's a color code for, for what's happening where, but that's as techy as I get. Um, and yes, like I said, I know people who swear by Scrivener. I'm sure it's super useful if you are a fast computer drafting writer. But for me, that's just a system that doesn't feel you know, natural. Do you use uh, Scrivener, Kim, or something else? You're so fast. Oh, <laughs> no, but I'm just like, it's so funny because I can totally picture you writing longhand with your, you know, you're sitting in your haunted Victorian library in the window and it's like raining outside and you're just like writing in a notebook. I cannot write in a notebook because I write so slow and my hands like immediately cramps because I don't write anymore. And I'm just like, this is not happening. No, I have to type. And actually I have used Scrivener for some projects and I was especially... There was a time when this was right around the time, like three years ago, when I still had a day job, like I was working full time in the library. And so I'm on the computer all day and then I go home and I'm on the computer like all night or all morning. And so I had gotten to the point where I was wearing a brace on both wrists because I was starting to feel like I was getting like tendonitis, like all this stuff. And so I just, I ended up like, right after I went full time, I had to do turn to dictation for like six months or something while that all healed up. And um, for some reason, it was working really well in Scrivener, like I was using dragon naturally speaking in Scrivener, and just dictating directly into it. So I don't know, like I've used it before, it is nice if you have a lot of 
like scenes, especially that you think you might rearrange in different order. And so you can just like drag and drop as opposed to having the one big file in Word. Although I will say like nowadays, I just do Word. <laughs> like I'm pretty much that makes more sense to me because I don't tend to write the scenes out of order. They don't tend to be the type of thing that I could just drag and drop anyway. So it's not um, that useful for me. The thing that I use more for gathering notes, because the other thing you can do with Scrivener is you can have like, you know, here's your file with all your characters, like all your character has a profile and here are maps and here are inspiration images and they're in this folder, et cetera, et cetera. I just use OneNote um, on my Mac and I have like different, um, you have different notebooks and you have different like sections of the notebook and each section has like all these different pages and you can do, you know, you can drag in images and it's just like you're taking notes on paper. And so that's why I love it. Cause it's not like a word document. It's like you can have these different boxes with different notes and drag them all over and they're like little sticky notes almost. And you can just do that. So I do that for all of my like brainstorming and planning and keeping track of like promotions and keeping track of like every single thing I'm doing in this big notebook. And that's kind of what I use, um, which is somewhat similar to what Scrivener does for media scripts. But I just use it for planning like everything, not for actual writing or anything like that. Um, but yes, and now I, I haven't used dictation in a really long time. So I'm back to typing, but I cannot imagine writing longhand. So I think that is so cool. I can totally, <laughs> I can just totally imagine it though. Um, wow, that is awesome. So yeah, Miss Nikki said that I write for my dog bed, which is a true story, but not anymore. I used to, I used to write from the dog bed. Um, so we've had a different time this past year. And I know for me, I used to be, I'd go through periods where I would write out at coffee shops or do different things like this. And then over the past year, I got very comfortable writing at home. And I think that it would be weird for me to go out and write somewhere else now. And maybe that's a good thing because I'm going to save a ton of money. Um, but do you have like different certain places that you like to write? Do you get inspired by travel or is it mostly like you're writing in your house and that's where you get the most done? Oh, I'm definitely inspired by travel, and that is something I miss so much. Um, I also had a baby right before all of this happened, so I kind of slid right from like postpartum life to pandemic life, which is a pretty easy downhill slide because you're already at home in your pajamas anyway. Um, but yeah, it's been a very long time since I've gotten to go anywhere that is unfamiliar. Um, and that always feels like, you know, kind of getting a blank canvas and getting, you know, to refill the well. Travel is just this amazing chance to see things anew or see things for the first time. Um, so that usually does help me, at least with the idea part of writing. Uh, and yeah, I'm generally, I'm a coffee shop writer. That's my favorite place to draft because then I don't have the million little hassle-y kind of distractions that you have at home. My lovely dog who can also be annoying. <laughs> yeah, the dishes, the internet. Um, and because I, like I said, I draft longhand, I can really just disconnect and take notebooks and pens and go somewhere like a coffee shop and have no distractions and just get into my imaginary world and have my cappuccino and just be in heaven. So I haven't gotten to do that in a very long time. Um, in fact, my my lovely sister-in-law gave me this beautiful tote bag, like handmade canvas special work bag for two birthdays ago. And I told myself I was gonna take it to the coffee shop ceremonially, like the first time I got to leave the baby with a sitter and actually go out and work again. And I still have not gotten to use that bag. It is still sitting on the other side of this room waiting for me to go work in a coffee shop again. And I cannot wait until I can. Um, yeah, in general, that is an atmosphere that works really well for me. And so this year, I mean, this year I just, I've done very little drafting. This year I just have giant gaps in my mind of like, what was I doing during that time? I don't know. If I got some writing done, I barely remember it um, because I've been now at home with two small children instead of getting to have them in school or having any childcare. This has been a very different year. So, but someday, coffee shops, lovely backpack, childcare. <laughs> yeah. Did you want me to unmute myself? Okay, well, um, yes, you will get to use the bag though. I 
totally believe it. Uh, well, we are approaching our time, but I want to make sure we get in anybody's last minute burning questions that they have for Jacqueline. And so for people who are maybe wanting to know if there is somewhere that they can find you, like if they want a signed copy or something like that, um, if they want to, maybe if you're doing any other events related to long loss of the virtual, <laughs> probably variety, um, let people know where they can find you and where they can maybe get this signed book. Sure, thank you for thinking of that. I'm always terrible at remembering that. Um, so Red Balloon Bookshop, which is a children's specialist bookshop there in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you get the chance to visit in person, do it. Um, but they also have a fabulous website and you can order signed copies, which will come with a bookmark and a special little sticker. I've already been in and signed stock. Um, but of course, you can also order the book from any of your favorite local independent bookstores. Um, Bookshop.org, if you are not near any of those bookstores, is also great. So yes, please feel free to support your favorite bookseller that way. Um, and then as far as events, I am still not booking anything in person. And I wish that I felt secure saying this fall, I'll be back to doing you know school visits. But I just don't know if that'll be happening yet. Um, so right now I'm in kind of a wait and see, but yes, this summer I'm doing a couple of virtual nerd camps. I know you are too. I think we're doing some panels together. Um, so I'm doing Nerd Camp Kansas and Nerd Camp Pennsylvania. One is in June, one is in July. Uh, and I do try to keep an updated list on my website, even if the events are just virtual. So you can find links and information at chocolateandwest.com. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens next. I would, would love to get out and do real events and festivals again someday. <laughs> Oh, yes, someday it will all happen, of course. Well, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for joining me. And, of course, we're on the Spooky Middle Grade um, YouTube channel right now, which if we have any educators listening who have not booked us yet for one of our Spooky Middle Grade virtual visits, you absolutely should. So we off offer free author Q&As for grades three through eight. And these are author panels that feature four amazing spooky middle grade authors. So both me and Jacqueline are a part of this crew and you can find out more about all of the authors involved at spookymiddlegrade.com. And then go to spookymiddlegrade.com slash virtual Q&A for information on how to book a Q&A for your class. They are totally free. And we are also, oh, I see that Miss Nikki has signed up very excited. <laughs> We've already visited with Miss Nikki and we love Miss Nikki. Um, but if you have not yet signed up, then definitely do so. Um, we also have on Spooky Middle Grade a book club that is happening. And so we are going to be reading Long Lost, I believe, for our June book. And we don't have the date announced yet, but it's going to be at the end of June. So if you are interested, definitely Follow Spooky Middle Grade on Instagram at Spooky Middle Grade or on Twitter at Spooky MG Books, I believe is what we are on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so we'll announce the date for that one. But funnily enough, our next book club live event that will be right here on YouTube is my book, <laughs> The Secret Life of Sam. And that is going to be tomorrow night at 8 EST, 7 CST. So if you are around, definitely stop by and join us. And thanks again, Jacqueline, for joining me tonight. This was awesome. As always, I have learned a lot. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's always so much fun. It's just yeah. Wi-Fi. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm just going to go picture you riding longhand all night. I love it. And I'll be typing. So. <laughs> so thanks again to everyone who joined us. And we hope to see y'all next time. Bye, everyone.